We'll hear argument next in number 917328, Leonel Torres Herrera v. James A. Collins. Hey everyone, this is Leon from Fiasco and Prologue Projects. On today's episode of 5 to 4, Peter, Rhiannon, and Michael are talking about Herrera v. Collins, a death penalty case from 1993. In a 6 to 3 vote, the court held that having new evidence of innocence does not entitle someone sentenced to death to habeas corpus proceedings, the last resort for capital punishment cases. This is 5 to 4, a podcast about how much the Supreme Court sucks. Welcome to 5 to 4, where we dissect and analyze the Supreme Court cases that have killed off our civil liberties in the service of a misguided intellectual experiment, like Edison killed Topsy the Elephant. (laughs) Wow. Are you guys familiar with the Topsy story? I am. From Bob's Burgers. I know. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) The electrocute an elephant. Yeah, Edison wanted to prove that uh, electricity was, like, powerful, and so he just killed an elephant with it. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. American hero. <laughs> Thanks for the light bulbs, dude. I am Peter. I'm here with Michael. Hey, everybody. And Rhiannon. Hi, 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 hi. And today we are talking about Herrera v. Collins. This is a case about the death penalty. And we haven't done a death penalty case yet. And we thought it would be a good time to do one for a couple of reasons. The holiday season. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but I think first, you know, we're like 48 something episodes in. So, you know, maybe a little overdue. Right. And second, the Trump administration has in its final months begun what appears to be a calculated effort to expedite pending federal executions. So after two decades without a single federal execution taking place, the administration carried out three in the span of four days this summer, has carried out 11 total this year and has more scheduled, including several immediately before Biden's inauguration. Yeah. So this has reignited some public debate, in large part because most likely the administration is doing this to make a statement about what they believe the role of the state to be in criminal justice, uh, which is a mechanism for inflicting punishment. Right. I will say up top that I am opposed to the death penalty, uh, in large part because I think the risk of executing an innocent person far outweighs whatever utility you might find uh, in killing evil people. To me, I think you can make a moral argument that certain crimes are deserving of death. You know, if someone brutally murders a child or founds a chapter of College Republicans, I get it. You know, (laughs) I'm not saying I agree, but like I get the argument in the abstract. (laughs) But this case isn't about the morality of killing someone who did something heinous. It's about the risk that you are almost always running, which is that you are maybe killing an innocent person. Mm -hmm. In this case, a man about to be executed filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus in court claiming that he had evidence of his innocence. If you don't know, habeas corpus is essentially a procedural mechanism for prisoners to claim that their imprisonment is unlawful and request that a court look into the matter. A habeas corpus is a right that stretches back to like medieval times, which is why we keep using the stupid Latin name in order to show that this is very old and fancy. That's right. Right. That's so, right. Ree, give us the background here. Sure. So... You know, just a note, this kind of feels like hearkening back to um, some older episodes. We're back in cases that start with some gruesome facts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a murder case, right? Uh, So it's a tough story. In September 1981, a passerby happened upon the dead body of police officer David Rucker on a highway in South Texas. Uh, This happened like just north of Brownsville. At about the same time that the passerby comes upon this dead body, another officer, Officer Enrique Carrizales, pulled over a speeding car traveling away from the scene where Rucker's body had been found. Mm -hmm. The driver of the speeding car fired at Officer Carrizales, and nine days later, Carrizales died of those wounds. And Carrizales had had a passenger with him, an officer partner in his police car, though. And that passenger, as well as Carrizales before he died, identified a man named Lionel Herrera as the shooter. So the investigation found other evidence that it linked Herrera to the murder as well. 
a license plate check on the car that was pulled over revealed that Herrera's girlfriend owned the car and he was found with the keys in his possession. Mm -hmm. Splatters of blood on the car and on Herrera's jeans matched Officer Rucker's blood type, but not Herrera's. This is before they could you could do the full DNA. So they were just like, yeah, it's type A. We got the guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Herrera's social security card was discovered next to Officer Rucker, the first victim's car. That one's pretty damning. Yeah. Not going to lie. <laughs> and, and Criminal uh, mastermind, dude. Yeah. Did he like leave yeah. a signed confession at the scene, too? Well, Jesus Christ. Well, uh, Herrera was carrying on him at the time of his arrest a letter that sort of, you know, it implicitly referred to knowledge of the deaths of the two officers. Right. Dude, um, who even has their social security card on them? <laughs> Let alone in a precarious position where it might like fly out of your pocket. The note is so ridiculous. It's like accusing the cops of being involved in like a drug smuggling ring with them. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, common conceptions of how sort of extreme interpersonal violence happens and murders and stuff is that, like, I don't know, people plan it and, <laughs> and like, try to do a good job at it. But, you know, as somebody who defends convicted murderers um, sometimes, <laughs> that's just not how it happens. I'm convinced I could get away with a murder. I read these cases and I'm like... <laughs> I yeah. know all yeah. the pitfalls to avoid. Yeah. I will not bring my right. social security card. Yeah. If you know you're the type of guy who might kill two cops one night, then just leave the social security card at home. Like, even if you take his confession yeah. card in his pocket at face right. value, it's like, dude, right. you're in a drug smuggling ring that involves several cops right. and you're carrying around your social security card. Right. Right. Here's a letter explaining the yeah. drug smuggling ring that I'm in. <laughs> Oh, man. I wish you guys could spend five minutes <laughs> with people accused of crime. <laughs> well, I have. Just talk to them about how they ended up where they are. <laughs> Mine were always people with MBAs, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> the more polished version. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Herrera went to trial and he is convicted of capital murder. A jury sentenced him to death. So began a long appeals process in which starting in 1990, so just about a decade after the trial and everything, Herrera began to assert that he was actually innocent and he had mm -hmm. not murdered the officers. Mm -hmm. And in support of his innocence claim, Herrera submitted to the courts four affidavits that pointed to the guilt of Raul Herrera, um, who was Lionel Herrera's deceased brother. Um Wait, wait. How how did his brother die? Uh, his brother had been murdered in 1984, a few years after, you know, the facts of this case happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to get into the claims like within the affidavits, the specifics of the affidavits. But it's important to say, I think, that these four pieces of evidence were all collected after Herrera's trial, and they call into question the reliability of his conviction. One affidavit is written by a former state judge in Texas. So uh, there are questions about whether this conviction is real, if Leonel Herrera really did it. The important thing is that new evidence that has come up since the initial trial, since Herrera's conviction, is what needs to be reviewed here. And I think here we should explain a little bit more about the habeas process. So habeas corpus is a parallel pathway to your direct appeals process. And the process is for asserting that your constitutional rights were violated at trial. If you're allowed to have your claims reviewed in habeas proceedings, this is a separate track from your direct appeals process in order to get a new pair of eyes to make sure that your trial was constitutionally fair. If there was a constitutional defect at your trial, like, for example, you weren't given access to your attorney or the prosecutor didn't turn over exculpatory evidence, you can be granted a new trial in habeas review. And habeas is also special because in some ways it's the only pathway to get your claims in front of any court. Some states have their own habeas procedures, but federal habeas is the last hope, kind of the last resort for constitutional claims after other appeals processes under state and federal law are exhausted or if you're past those appeals deadlines. Yeah, right. 
And so Herrera submits all of this documentary evidence of his innocence in federal court. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals denied his claims. And basically, they said, like, he had not presented claims for which there was federal relief that could be granted. Right. So they wouldn't even review the evidence. Right. 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 They just tossed it out um, saying, like, we can't help you. This isn't a legal claim that we can even review. Right. right. So Herrera then appealed that decision to the Supreme Court. And that's how we get this uh, case dog shit oh. opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So to be clear, what Herrera is asking for is just that the evidence be heard. And he is asking that that be done through uh, habeas corpus, the right of habeas corpus. And when it is denied, what he brings to the Supreme Court is a constitutional claim. What he says is, look, the Eighth Amendment forbids cruel and unusual punishment. And what exactly that means has been the subject of much debate between liberals and conservatives, both because it's a very vague term and also because most of conservatism is just sort of creating fictional enemies and then fantasizing about punishing them. <laughs> and so Herrera is saying, look, executing me would be cruel and unusual punishment because I am innocent. Right. It makes sense. And you should review this evidence and determine whether or not that is the case. And the court right. in a six to three decision says... No, no, I think we're good here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to look at this mm, shit. <laughs> no, thank you. I should note up top, there's also a 14th Amendment claim here, substantive due process under the 14th Amendment claim, basically saying that his fundamental right to have his evidence heard is being violated. We think it's like sort of substantively the same as the Eighth Amendment claim. So we're going to mostly ignore it. But just again, it's just so some nerd doesn't yell at us about not covering every aspect of this case. Right. So Chief Justice William Rehnquist uh, takes off his Klan hood and pops on his executioner's hood uh, to write the majority opinion here. His opinion does not actually address the question of whether executing an innocent person would violate the Eighth Amendment. Instead, he sort of turns this into a procedural issue. Right. He says, like, well, look, you already had a trial here, and that trial determined that you were guilty. So you can't use a habeas corpus petition to claim that you're innocent after a trial occurs, because that would essentially require a court to look at this again. And that's just too much. We don't need to do it. You know, put in the best light, taking the conservatives, uh, <laughs> assuming they're acting in good faith here. The idea <laughs> is that all of these procedural protections under the Constitution, like the due process protections, are meant to protect innocent people. But mm -hmm. you can't just claim according to them, well, I'm innocent and that's a constitutional issue. What they're saying is if you had a fair trial and that determined you were guilty, then you're not innocent because innocence or guilt is the output of that process. You have to tie your innocence claim to some procedural unfairness. That's what the conservatives are saying. Right. 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 And, and so like Rehnquist has this sort of remarkable portion, a couple paragraphs right in the middle of the opinion where he says, look, you know, evidence uh, that you're innocent it's not that it has no place in habeas. Let me tell you where we care about it. And the thing is, like getting into a habeas court is complicated and you have to jump through a ton of hoops. And if you mess up one, maybe years ago, the court won't hear your claims. They'll say, sorry, you know, you you didn't do this weird random thing that, you, you know, no reasonable person should even know that they had to do. And so we can't even hear your claim. And what Rehnquist says is, look, in those cases... If you have evidence that you're actually innocent, we'll give you a pass on messing up this like nuts and bolts process. But once you get into habeas court, we still don't care whether or not you have evidence that you're actually innocent. That's still not what the court's looking at. And it's not what it's concerned with. It's still concerned with whether your trial met the constitutional bare minimum of fairness. And so think about what this is saying. This is saying we don't actually care if you're actually innocent. All we care about is whether you got proper process, if your trial was fair. If you have a claim that your trial was unfair, like we'll hear that. But actual innocence is only important in so far as it lets us decide whether your trial is fair. It's elevating process over substance. Yeah, absolutely. And saying what's important is the fairness yes. of your trial and not the accuracy of the outcome. Right. Yeah. It's like they're treating innocence as if it's not a real thing, but just the sort of determination of this system. That's right. right. It's just completely bizarre. Right. And the obvious gap that this is creating in who can sort of avail themselves of the process of habeas corpus 
is people with newly discovered evidence, evidence right. that's found after their trial. Right? right. So they can't say that they have a constitutional claim about what happened at trial because it's something new or subsequent developments that happened separate and apart from their trial and afterwards. Right. Yeah. So what Rehnquist is saying, you know, I, I think in short is this guy has already had a trial at that trial. He was found to be guilty. And after you're convicted and sentenced to death, you can't use a habeas corpus petition to claim your innocence. That is not a cognizable claim under the Constitution. Right. So Justice Sandra Day O'Connor files a concurrence that is basically just a slightly more empathetic version of the majority opinion. Right. We haven't really ever talked about her that much. Uh, she was the first woman on the court, a uh, conservative appointed by Reagan. And uh, these types of concurrences are a staple of her jurisprudence, in my view. Absolutely. The dudes yeah. on the court will file some, like, deeply heartless opinion. And she'll file a concurrence saying, like, look, I agree with every pertinent part of that opinion, but here is a slightly nicer version of it. And everyone will be like, wow, Sandra was so nice. Um, <laughs> what if you take this awful, psychotic opinion, but um, you just take it with a spoonful of sugar? <laughs> yeah. So here she says, like, look, if an innocent person were executed, that would violate the Constitution. But that's not what's happening here because this guy had a fair trial and he was found guilty. And that's that. Right. And, you know, it's important to note what the court is being asked is not to decide whether this guy is innocent or not. It's to decide whether this evidence should be looked at to figure out right. whether he is innocent. Right. Yes. The conservatives are reacting to a man on death row claiming that there's evidence of his innocence with like the exasperation of a chef reacting to a guy sending back his food for the third straight time. It's just like, <laughs> eh, it's always something with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. It just doesn't seem like too much to ask for a court to take a look at a fairly, I, I shouldn't say necessarily legitimate, but a fairly extensive claim of innocence right. before the state of Texas literally ends his life. Is that really too much to ask? Right. Look at it. Yeah. Review it. It's obviously stupid and cruel, even on their own terms, like on the this procedural question that they choose to answer. Uh, do we have to require courts to review new evidence, that kind of thing? By most accounts and based on the way the majority opinion was written, it actually seems like Chief Justice Rehnquist wanted to answer the constitutional question and he wanted to answer it. No, right. like Rehnquist would have liked to rule in the way that Scalia describes in his concurrence, which we'll discuss in just a little bit, to basically say that actual innocence is not a cognizable constitutional claim. And one reason the majority and concurrences kind of seem confusing on some ticky tack points is that Rehnquist likely wrote this majority opinion saying what he wanted to say right. and coming to his conclusion, but he just couldn't get a five justice majority on that. Right. Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy are um, sort of known as the more centrist conservative justices. And, you know, obviously they wouldn't join that kind of opinion. Right. So Justice Rehnquist sort of changes just the end of the opinion to be like, well, OK, really, this is just about the procedure stuff. And it would be terrible if someone was allowed to get a second bite of the apple just because they have new evidence that tends to show their complete fucking innocence. <laughs> right. So still, this opinion and the concurrences like stand as one of the starker cases from the Supreme Court on the death penalty, because while they dodge the bigger questions for more narrow procedural ones, like it's clear that what they're doing is tacitly accepting that the Constitution does not prevent an innocent person from being executed. Yeah. I feel like if you told someone on the street that that was the case, they wouldn't believe you. That seems right. like anathema to, mm -hmm. you know, the legal protections you're supposed to get in court. Yeah. Yeah. We always talk about the fact that rights without remedies are not really rights. And like this is, I think, a big theme of this case. Like the majority is sort of dodging the question of whether there's a constitutional right to not be executed if you're innocent. But in a way, they're answering it. They're holding that yes. there's no constitutional remedy for an innocent person who has been sentenced to death. And without that remedy, right. the right doesn't exist. Right. Exactly. When I read cases like this, there's like a question that like always is just sort of in the back of my mind, which is like, what's the point of having a criminal justice system at all? And I don't mean that like rhetorically, right. like literally, like what social problem are we solving? Right. A lawless society, I imagine, would be something like, you know, the mob, right? Like a lynch mob. That's right. what we're trying to replace. We're trying to prevent. If you have a fair, just 
criminal justice system, you won't have gangs of people going around, you know, putting nooses around someone's neck because they're pissed that their store got robbed. Right. 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 And when I read opinions like this, that doesn't feel right. That's not compatible with this. Right. If that were the case, then executing an innocent person would like cut to the core of that. Yeah. Instead, it feels like what they want to do is like formalize the mob. Yeah. Like legitimize yes. the mob. Like, oh, yeah. you know, it's okay if we're putting a noose around some rando's neck as long as he had a lawyer and he got right. to, right. you know, present evidence. Yeah. So believe it or not, the opinions in this case get worse. Boy, do they. Yes. <laughs> Justice Antonin Scalia, buy our merch, 54pod.com. <laughs> Files a concurrence here. As we just noted, the majority doesn't expressly say that executing an innocent person is not a violation of the 8th and 14th Amendments. Right. So Scalia files this concurrence so that he can say that it's definitely yep. not a yeah. violation of the Constitution. That's yeah. right. Uh, his concurrence is brief and snarky. This is 1993. And Scalia sort of has sort of like hit his stride in terms of like his sense of intellectual superiority. It only grows from here, but this is where you really start to see it in the early 90s. Decades of being bullied for being a big know-it-all dork has culminated in a lifetime appointment without any tangible accountability. And so he's taking it out on everyone. Uh, we all have to deal with it. <laughs> Scalia says there's no reason to think that there's a constitutional right to have new evidence heard after you're convicted. Specifically, he says there's nothing, quote, in text, tradition, or even in contemporary practice, unquote, to suggest that such a right exists. He doesn't really elaborate, but I still think it's important to talk about this because it fits squarely into a theme we've touched on several times before, which is the conservative weaponization of history to justify the wrongs of the present. And that's really what he's yes. getting at here. Right. Scalia's like originalist interpretation of what cruel and unusual punishment means is rooted in like what would have been thought to be cruel or unusual at the time of the Constitution being written. Right. I don't want to get too into originalism as an academic pursuit. But when it first gained steam in the early 70s, it was primarily about trying to determine the original intent of the Constitution, uh, meaning like the, what the founding fathers intended. And over the ensuing decades, that sort of fell out of fashion in favor of what they call the original meaning, meaning what the public would have thought the Constitution meant at the time. And right. I bring this up because in, in a way, the shift from intent to meaning was sort of strategic by conservatives because in large part what the founders intended was probably going to be a bit more liberal than what the public would have interpreted. And I bring it up because this is a great example. The founding fathers themselves had fairly nuanced views on capital punishment. It's the late 1700s and Western aristocracy have like just started to think about whether killing people is bad or something. Um, right. Yeah. Cesar yeah. Beccaria, uh, that's my attempt at the, pronouncing that Italian name, wrote about punishment and specifically sort of condemned capital punishment. And that like his work really gained favor among the founding fathers. So if you're trying to figure out what they intended, you might think, well, the Constitution might want to avoid a situation like this. Right. But if you're trying to figure out what the general public would have thought, you're talking about people who were living substantially closer to a time when we executed people suspected of witchcraft than they do to the present. Right, in right. the early colonies, petty larceny could result in execution. So to use mm -hmm. that era's norms as a barometer for what like cruel and unusual punishment means is essentially to just write the clause out of the Constitution, right? These people were psychotic. Right. And I bring this up to point out how conservatives' embrace of history as a useful tool for guiding the present is done very selectively. And that's why we say that they're weaponizing history, right? They're not learning from it or building on it. They are selectively using it to back what they already believe. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And there is one bit of Scalia snark that I want to talk about for a sec, which is he says that he understands the court's reluctance to admit publicly that the Constitution would let stand any injustice, much less the execution of an innocent man. So he's like literally being sarcastic about the idea that the Constitution might have something to say about yeah. killing yeah. someone you know to be innocent. Yeah. And he turns around and he follows that up and he says, like, look, if you have some real evidence, you'll probably just get a pardon. 
Yeah. And then, you know, the court <laughs> right. won't have to deal with this shit anymore. He literally he says it right. is improbable that the evidence uh, would fail to produce an executive partner. And with any luck, we shall avoid ever having to face this embarrassing question again. Embarrassing whether or not the Constitution has anything to say about killing an innocent person. Yeah, that's what right. he thinks. Fuck that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's worth talking about since we've mentioned that um, the conservative majority here is choosing to take on a formalistic procedural question rather than the big constitutional question. I think it's worth discussing a little bit like what the Supreme Court could have done in this case to have come to a better result. This one is almost so obvious that it's maybe like a little bit stupid or like elementary. The court should have taken up the larger constitutional question. Is it cruel and an unusual yes. punishment to be executed for a crime you did not commit? And the yeah, answer right. is obviously, obviously, yes, that is unconstitutional. That right. is cruel and unusual because, of course, it is like what kind of depraved, fucked up, insane, authoritarian view of state power <laughs> do you have to think otherwise? You don't right. have to be a right. fucking whiz kid legal genius to like think that in a democracy, the law shouldn't have to like mm, sometimes be cool with innocent people being murdered by the state. Like that's right. crazy. But there are yeah. lots of reasons why that didn't happen. Not least of which because of like an ideologically conservative understanding of when and where a court is supposed to step in on a case and on whose behalf. Yeah. Right. I think it's important to note that, you know, it might have been very simple for the conservatives to say, look, it's uh, unconstitutional to execute a, an innocent person. But in this case, we're not going to give him habeas review. And for all these reasons, I think the reason they didn't do that is because they don't want to create a constitutional right that they then have yes. to sort of afford some procedural protections to. Right. If you say, it's yeah. you know, you can't do this under the Constitution then you have to explain what they're actually doing to prevent it from happening. And right, this right. court doesn't want to do anything to prevent it from happening. Right. It's very easy to see how that would play out. Even if you're sending it down to the lower courts to figure it out, there'd have to be some standard for the type of evidence that even gets you habeas review and then the persuasiveness yes. of that evidence to right, like right. actually get your petition granted. And it would be a right. lot of work. And man, it would suck if they would have to hear a lot of these cases. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think like the court sees itself here. And I'd say in the vast majority of its cases, not as like reviewing a criminal case and subsequent developments in order to vindicate an individual person's rights. They aren't looking at the procedures in place for people to have their day in court. And they're not trying to formulate more expansive pathways so that even people and prisoners with few resources can have all of the information that they would like presented to a court reviewed closely and fairly before the state can fucking kill them. Yeah. Here, it's very clear that the court sees itself instead as like protecting the dockets of lower courts, making sure right. that the pathway is as narrow as possible because we don't want all of these cases. You know, on the one right. hand, in death penalty jurisprudence, the Supreme Court emphasizes that, like, the death penalty should only be given to the worst of the worst, you know, like the most extreme or depraved or violent or hurtful kinds of capital murder. But in this case, we see how much like those writings, those other opinions are just paying lip service to sort of these more just principles, because here what they're saying is. Man, like if some guy who's innocent gets executed, like that's just a sacrifice our system must bear because God damn would right, it right. suck if people were able to use federal courts to hear these kinds of claims. Like, God, yeah. we're tired of all the complaining. And I don't think it's right. worth like trying to get into the mind of these freaks too much because I promise you it'll be a hundred times more terrifying and depraved than any of the minds of any quote unquote criminal client I've represented. But this flows, I think, from a conception of what it means to be a judge, that you make courts and access to legal remedies less available to common people. You know, this idea that it should be hard, that the burden on an individual must be impossibly high to get a court to do shit for you. Like that from this opinion really makes me really sick. Yeah. And I think something that makes this case like maybe even worse is that, look, this guy, there was a lot of evidence against him. And sure. I mean, I think you could argue that the evidence that he was innocent is kind of weak. And yeah. so, I mean, I could see a listener listening to this and being like, well, yeah, but look, I don't think they put an innocent man to death. Like, I think they right. put a guilty guy to death and maybe, right. but that's even worse. <laughs> that's yeah. literally even worse because the court is 
closing off pathways that maybe should be available for people with far more persuasive evidence, right. yes. far more compelling evidence. In this case, you know, sending this back, the most likely scenario is that a judge looks at this, maybe takes testimony from the former judge in person to evaluate his credibility. Right. And otherwise it's like, nah. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. I think all three of us would like, you know, put a gun to my head and say, is this guy innocent or guilty? Guilty. Don't um, speak for me. <laughs> you think he's innocent? No, you don't. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. But that's yeah. the point I'm right. making, but, Reed. Yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> the innocence of this guy is not what's really at issue here. The question is whether someone who produces evidence that he is innocent after his conviction can right. have that heard in court. And right. if this guy is guilty, so be it. Let a court look at the evidence. Right. Exactly. And I think it should be emphasized how much this opinion is sort of a sign of the times in terms of like where our legal institutions, you know, where they were at in their treatment of criminality and the justice system. Like it wasn't that long ago. We mentioned this opinion came down in 1993, but it does feel like the product of a sort of bygone era, particularly because of the consequences like this decision and other so-called tough on crime approaches in the 80s and 90s had, particularly on the poor and people of color and how that's affected like public understandings of uh, how the death penalty is carried out. So just to illustrate this point a bit, this opinion comes down in 1993. The next year, 1994, the federal crime bill written by Joe Biden becomes law, and that included the expansion of the use of the federal death penalty to more than 60 new crimes. And then in 1996, EDPA, which is the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, was passed. Yeah. How'd that do on preventing terrorism, by the way? 1996. <laughs> well, Weren't the first World Trade Center bombings in 96? No, it was 93. Oh, were they? 93 is oh. Oklahoma City. No, 95 is Oklahoma City. 93 is World Trade Center. Guys. Really? EDPA is passed after Oklahoma City. Yeah. So that yeah. Tim McVeigh can get fucking fried. That was back when they called that terrorism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, MAGA. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. The official yeah. position of like Ted Cruz is that <laughs> Timothy McVeigh was a freedom fighter. <laughs> Um, so you see that, like, institutionally in the U.S. at this time, there was a sort of, like, bloodthirstiness for use of the death penalty. And often this urge for state-sponsored violence was couched in language about making capital sentencing and the criminal justice system more broadly more efficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Effective death penalty act. We, exactly. We want an exactly. effective death penalty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God. <laughs> From the late 80s to the late 90s, you know, the incidence of people being sentenced to death in the U.S. peaked, as did the number of executions carried out. So in 1994, 1995 and 1996, there were more than 300 people sentenced to death each of those years in the United States. And this is happening at the same time that governors, state legislators, Congress and judges are talking about death penalty appeals taking too long, that we need to reduce the amount of time between when a person mm -hmm. is convicted of a capital crime and when they're executed. Right. Look, you can't really sate the mob if you make them wait 10 <laughs> years to see their right. public hanging. I mean, that really is it, right? It yeah. really yeah. is it. No, that is it. It's satiating this sort of public bloodthirst. And it's so deeply intertwined with like the conservative conception of what to do about crime, which is just which is genocide. Well, sure. I mean, but you divide <laughs> society into good guys and bad guys and just act accordingly. And it's like right, we already right. found out they're a bad guy. What else is there to discuss? That's really their perspective. Yeah. Right, right. All that said, with today's understandings of how all these laws like actually played out, it's hard to imagine this opinion being written in 2020, like this level of callousness. Mm -hmm. right. In 1993, the idea that innocent people were routinely being caught up in the criminal justice system, much less that they were being executed, had not really proliferated like across public discourse. Right. right. At this time, there were not innocence projects across the country bringing a light to these cases. And there just wasn't like a comprehensive body of information about wrongful convictions. Um, you know, the Death Penalty Information Center, it's a really big um, nonprofit organization that does a lot of reporting and dissemination of studies about how the death penalty is carried out in the U.S. Like they were only founded in 1990. And they say that uh, since 1973, there have been 172 people exonerated from death row in the United States, 
And the vast majority of those have been after 1990 Mm -hmm. and after this case. The justices, when they're writing Herrera, they just don't have in the front of their minds these stories of innocent people being executed. They just don't think it's a big problem. Right. Right. A huge aspect of this is advances in technology, especially in DNA, where all of a sudden we have something that is as close to proof as the criminal justice system will ever really see. Mm -hmm. And you have these cases where you can definitively say, wow, that guy didn't do it. He wasn't the rapist. He wasn't the murderer. And the idea that we were getting some like sizable chunk of these wrong was suddenly introduced into the public consciousness with strong evidence. Right. Right. We said that there hadn't been federal executions in two decades, and that spans Bush's tenure. Right. Like, just a few years later, you know, you had a conservative president and they were not putting people to death. Yes. It's not a big stretch to think that this was just like a few years too early. Yeah, exactly. And we should say that developments in like forensic science, DNA, technological innovations, all of that has prompted some states to change their appeals and habeas proceedings like slightly, which is why you might hear of people on death row being exonerated. You know, we set up top that there are state habeas proceedings in some states and federal habeas proceedings as well. And we should be clear that this decision uh, still stands. It's still law. So at the federal level, you are not entitled to habeas relief based only on an innocence claim. We should keep in mind that states don't always, you know, do a great job at reviewing cases in state court, in part because they have a history of doing a shit job at all of this. You know, like uh, being racist, of being discriminatory, of carrying out executions in arbitrary and capricious ways. And the other thing, of course, is that you have federal prosecutions like the ones we mentioned up top. Those cases don't start in state court. And because of this decision in Herrera, people with standalone innocence claims are not entitled to federal habeas review, even if you have something like newly discovered DNA. This case is still identified as being one of the worst cases in Supreme Court jurisprudence on the death penalty by, you know, academics who study the Eighth Amendment and capital defense practitioners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The broad lesson for me is that the Supreme Court is sort of always behind the times. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be out front on these issues, even though they could be equipped to do so. And even though I think like in public conceptions of what the Supreme Court does or supposed to do, I think most people would think like, yeah, that's what the Supreme Court does is step in on exactly this kind of issue is hear somebody's plea who's saying, like, I'm scheduled for execution and I'm actually innocent and I have evidence. And I just think this case is a reminder that they are going to be behind, you know, public trends, not in front of them and certainly not starting them. And in many ways, the institution sort of holds us back from social progress. And I want to point out something that goes hand in hand with that, which is, yes, they are sort of behind the times in many ways. That doesn't impact their confidence. It didn't impact the way that Scalia wrote about this case as if it was open and shut. This is an institution that has, in this case, no fucking idea what it's talking about. No concept of what the risk that they're running when they deny this man a hearing on his evidence of innocence actually is. And yet they speak as if they do. And Right. Just take a step back and picture the various ways in which the current court speaks with confidence when they have no real vision into what's actually happening yes. in criminal justice, in employment. I mean, across, you know, a hundred different possible topics. These are people who need to demonstrate some amount of humility, humble themselves a little before their responsibility. And you just do not see that in what they do. And that's why they fucking suck. That's why they suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I was chatting with somebody the other day and I made the point that I was like, look, as long as your brain isn't like totally rotten from cable news, especially but not limited to Fox News, and you have like an ounce of compassion, your politics are probably fine. Mm-hmm. Maybe not great. Maybe you're not like fucking Martin Luther King or whatever, but they're probably right. fine. Mm-hmm. Cable news wasn't really nearly what it is now in 1993 right and their politics was still awful and you just have to think like how little empathy and compassion and concern for their fellow man these people had 
they are fucking demons. Yeah. I mean, it, right. it's this ideological poison. They have this concept in their mind that they stick with very firmly, which is that the Constitution doesn't necessarily do anything. And we're not making these like sort of moral judgment calls. And so that is how we create emotional and moral distance from our rulings. Yeah. We can say, look, sure, the Constitution doesn't prevent this from happening. That's so unfortunate. You know, we, t- we totally wish it did. <laughs> But it just doesn't. And you libs need to accept that. That's the sort of consequence of what is in the early 90s, 20 or so years of conservative ideology and the law being ascendant. Yeah. And I just want to get back to the Trump executions that we mentioned at the beginning. So the latest three people who have been executed by the federal government, I think it's worth just uh, saying their names and talking a little bit about what happened at their trials, because in this case, Rehnquist and O'Connor and Scalia are so focused on the fairness of the trial proceedings. And I think it's worth highlighting what happens in this area of the law that, you know, the conservative justices have convinced themselves is sufficient and fair and constitutionally permissible. Orlando Hall was executed on November 19th of this year. Mr. Hall was a black man. He was convicted by an all white jury and his attorneys argued uh, until his execution that the prosecutor in his case had engaged in racially discriminatory behavior throughout the entirety of Mr. Hall's trial. Brandon Bernard, you might have heard about, he was executed on December 10th, just a couple of days ago from this recording. He was executed for the shooting deaths of two people, but Brandon was not the gunman. We talked in a previous episode about felony murder rules where somebody who actually did not kill anybody can be executed for somebody's murder. And in fact, in Mr. Bernard's case, newly revealed evidence showed that prosecutors withheld important information at Mr. Bernard's trial, showing that he had an even less important role than jurors were led to believe at the time they convicted him and sentenced him to death. With that new information, five of the nine jurors who convicted Mr. Bernard said that if they had been aware of the new information, which was undisclosed to the public, they would not have sentenced Brandon Bernard to death. And in the case of Alfred Bourgeois, uh, he was executed on December 11th, just a day after Mr. Bernard. He was executed despite the fact that he was intellectually disabled. He had an IQ between 70 and 75. There is a fairly longstanding constitutional rule that we cannot execute a person who is intellectually disabled. And, um, you know, that execution was carried out. Yeah, yeah. You know, Peter, you said up top that you you think that there is, you know, probably a moral argument for somebody, you know, who commits a, a specifically or egregiously heinous act of murder and that may be morally being deserving of the death penalty. Right. I think what's important and that what I see sort of in my work and in uh, talking and thinking about these issues all the time is that. You know, I probably agree with you. I probably think like there is a CEO who has wrought violence and harm on enough people that, you know, maybe morally is deserving of getting offed. But um, <laughs> Robespierre over here has some thoughts yeah. <laughs> about what crimes are and are not capital. <laughs> All right. Let's let's restate so that you don't have to say getting offed. <laughs> that are deserving of execution of the death penalty. But I think that in carrying out the death penalty in a modern society, the instances of where it actually happens for which crimes, who gets prosecuted for it, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of just meta moral argument is so abstracted from the reality of how human beings in a society like are metting out punishment. Yeah. And that and that is how I meant like I see the moral argument. I don't necessarily agree with it, but to the extent I do agree with it, it's completely in the abstract and sort of manifestation of that abstract concept into the death penalty as we know it is like completely distant from the moral argument. It it has almost no relation. It's the manifestation of public bloodthirst, state violence, 
and the systemic oppression of massive populations of people. I don't know that I buy the moral argument, even in the abstract. You know, we give the state the monopoly on violence, right? That's part of the social compact. We get to decide the limits of that violence. I mean, I think there's an argument for just saying, look, you don't get to kill people. That's it. And it doesn't matter the crime. Like, that's something that we've decided we don't want to give the state for, you know, small L libertarian reasons about autocracy, oppression, injustice, all that. And, And just like... I think what I'm saying is that I just don't even think the death penalty discussion is even asking the right questions all the time. Like, are there crimes heinous enough to deserve death? That's not the right question to right. me. I think you guys agree. Yeah. But also, is there an intolerable risk of getting it wrong and killing an innocent person? I don't think that's the right question either. Mm. Maybe they're good for like persuading people, but in terms of what's right and wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of first principle questions. What type of society do we want to live in? What do we collectively value? How should those values be reflected in the government we build for ourselves? Yeah. And, you know, I want to live in a society that's compassionate. It's merciful. It values life. Yes. And I don't see a place for the death penalty in that at all. Yeah. Something that is sort of really persuasive to me is the idea that because we live in a society that allows the state to murder people legally, then what sort of violence do we accept from the state after that? If they're allowed to kill somebody, then, right. you know, it sort of just logically flows that we accept a lot of state violence, you yeah. know, just from that premise. Right. I think there's an idea that is common among reactionaries that part of the state's role and maybe even one of the largest parts of the state's role is to punish malfeasance and to act as the manifestation of the anger of society broadly towards people who deviate in their minds. And of course, what reactionaries view as deviation always aligns with their views of social hierarchies, etc. And that's why these systems act to facilitate and continue these oppressive structures. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's like a sort of academic or legal argument for things like the death penalty and retributive justice that like it discourages private violence. I am not convinced that it's not the opposite. Right. That creates a culture and an idea that death is an appropriate punishment. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we forgive uh, when people meet it out privately. Right. Like when a fight breaks out or whatever, and one guy gets killed. Well, that's, you know, that's just what happens. And this ends up often being that when white people kill black people, um, we're like, well, what was he up to? This is the output, a culture where Trayvon Martin can be murdered, where Eric Garner can be murdered. Right. And people think that's fine. Right. Because death is an appropriate punishment for selling loose cigarettes. Right. 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 An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. (laughs) Gandhi told you already. (laughs) So um, we are going to take the holiday season off. There are going to be some announcements, the first of which we can actually make. We will be guesting on a podcast uh, very soon uh, called Know Your Enemy, which I think will probably pop into our feed so our uh, listeners can check it out. And we will have some very big announcements in the new year. You may have noticed we don't currently have ads. We have cast off our corporate shackles and are uh, <laughs> looking for newer, better shackles uh, to, to place on ourselves. So hopefully uh, some cool announcements in the new year. Peter, what'd you get me for Christmas? Uh, just I was just going to Venmo you 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do have a Christmas present for you guys. Shut it's up. the friendship bracelets I promised you <laughs> 10 months ago. Oh, yeah. And never yeah, sent. Yeah. Yeah. Hell They're yeah. Coming. They're coming. 5-4 is presented by Prologue Projects. This episode was produced by Katja Kumkova with editorial oversight by Leon Nafok and Andrew Parsons. Our artwork is by Teddy Blanks at Chips NY, and our theme song is by Spatial Relations. 